move forward. <clears throat> okay, uh, moving on to 11C, Commission General Re Regulation 408, Aquatic Invasive Species Decontamination Regulations, LCB file number R048-12, uh, Chief Rob Bonamici and Fisheries uh, Staff Biologist Karen Vargas. Uh, the Commission may adopt a regulation relating to aquatic species, providing requirements for decontamination of certain vessels and conveyances, and providing other matters properly relating thereto. And just for information, uh, the uh, Clark County Advisory Board had Karen um, uh, attend the CAB meeting, and she put on a presentation, very good informational uh, item uh, with regard to this issue, uh, and uh, um, found it very informative. Uh, go ahead. Uh, for the record, Chief Game Warden Rob Bonamici. Uh, LCB file number R048-12 uh, pertains to decontamination requirements uh, with regards to vessels. And just real quick, it's going to be a background. In uh, last legislative session, uh, a bill was introduced to address aquatic invasive species. And as a result of that, bill introdu introduction, uh, there's NRS 488-530, and 488-536 that uh, became law. And so these regulations are in response uh, to those laws and the legal requirements we have. So with that, uh, the first the regulation we're hearing now addresses decontamination. Section 1, except as otherwise provided in subsection 2, a person required to decontaminate a vessel or conveyance pursuant to paragraph C of subsection 1 of NRS 488-530 shall, and just to NRS 488-530, uh, subsection C of 1 basically says it's unlawful for a person, this is the NRS, not the regulation, it's unlawful for a person at any time to leave an impaired body of water in this state or any other state after operating a vessel on that impaired body of water and launch the vessel in another body of water in this state without first decontaminating the vessel and conveyance used on the impaired body of water. So what that requires upon us is to notify the public, what do you need to do to decontaminate? So that, that's why this regulation. So persons required to decontaminate shall a, inspect all exposed surfaces on the vessel or conveyance. B, remove and kill all aquatic invasive species that are visible on the vessel or conveyance. C, remove all aquatic plant material and any other debris visible on the vessel or conveyance. D, inspect, clean, and dry each item on the vessel or conveyance, including without limitation, each life jacket, water ski, anchor, rope, and piece of equipment for fishing. E, at or reasonably near the site at which the vessel or conveyance is taken out of the impaired body of water, drain all water from the vessel or conveyance and from any equipment on the vessel or conveyance, including without limitation, any water held in the ballast tank, motor cooling system, bilge, live well, motor, or lower outboard unit. Okay, the idea there, the concept is we want the vessel drained near the impaired body of water. It's already impaired, so putting the contaminated water, you know, at or near the impaired body of water isn't a threat but we don't want people taking the boat, for example, from Lake Mead coming up to Wild Horse. Oh, I forgot to drain it at Lake Mead, so I'm gonna drain it here. You know, realistically, it's gonna probably be dry by then. That, that's what we're trying to prevent. 
uh, F, wash the vessel and any portion of the conveyance that was in contact with the impaired body of water with high pressure hot water. And G, allow the vessel or conveyance to dry for not less than the period recommended by the drying time estimator of the 100th Meridian Initiative, which is available at its website, and it lists the website. And then two, there's another option for folks. In lieu of complying with the provisions of subsection one, the person may decontaminate the vessel or conveyance at an inspection station or aquatic invasive species using a method approved by the department for that inspection station. So with that, glad to answer any questions. Okay. Got one. Oh, okay. Uh, Al. I haven't been out on the lake in several years now. But at Lake Mead, I'm talking about. Have they got those uh, decontamination station or inspection stations out there now? January. Yep, there are decontamination stations available at Lake Mead. Uh, at all the marinas or... No, not all the marinas, but uh, several of them do have them. The other issue is keeping in mind the NRS that I read. We really don't, aren't concerned about people that go boating on Lake Mead. You know, they live in Las Vegas. They go boating this Saturday, and then next Saturday they go back out. They're remaining, they're boating on that contaminated water. So that's not a concern to us. But when that boat goes from Lake Mead to Lake Tahoe, for example, that is of concern to us. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to address here. Commissioner Drew. The only question I had, uh, <clears throat> Rob, was with G with that 100th Meridian. It, is there just not a cleaner way to do that? And do you have a sense of what kind of drying times we're talking about? Is it a matter of days? Is it a matter of weeks? Uh, the, the 100th Meridian, it's uh, kind of a temperature-based scale. So obviously the warmer it is, the quicker the drying time. So down in <clears throat> Vegas, for example, the drying time this time of year is going to be fairly short. And I can look, in fact, I'll look that up. I'm venturing to guess we're talking, you know, a day or two or three. But so I'll look that up and provide you that information as an example. And then in the winter time, obviously it's a lot longer because of cooler temperatures and so forth. So if you were going to go to from Lake Mead to say Kirch Wildlife Area, you would have to clean the boat and let it dry for whatever that recommended minimum <clears throat> day length is? Right. Or is that only if you're stopped and asked to decontaminate? No, you're, you're required to do that. In addition, say it turns out, you know, we're getting a lot of traffic from Lake Mead to Sunnyside and we're in the process of trying to obtain some wash stations, some seasonal employees and all that is you know, coming down the road. So when that happens, if we determine, you know, obviously we can't cover every body of water, but if we determine, for example, that's an important one to cover, then we can have a decontamination unit, portable one there with a seasonal employee. So wild horse, for example, up here, you're going to be seeing decon a decontamination unit available pretty soon. And that'll be available for the fishermen, the boaters, what have you, to utilize to decontaminate their boat right there. And if we have the inspection there, then you could leave Lake Mead, technically not do anything, but when you arrive at Wild Horse, you have to have them decontaminate your boat before you launch it. Just a question about that website, um, the 100th Meridian, is that getting to be common practice? Is the LCB allowing to have a website for the information that's, I, mean, I, I don't remember seeing that before and I remember them like rejecting things or referring to other documents before. Yes, you're, you're correct. Uh, they, the LCB is reluctant to use the websites, however, and we've had regulations where we've actually taken the websites out of 
in the past, but in this case, LCB looked at it, and there there really aren't any other options uh, because we want people not only in Nevada but coming from other states from impaired bodies of water to be able to readily access this information and comply with the law. So this was. It's it's not the ideal scenario. exception to their common practice, right? But it's okay. In this case, it's about the only way to go right now. Commissioner Hal, if if I read this correctly, uh, if you take advantage of this uh, inspection station, you don't have to worry about the drying time then, right? Correct. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I also mentioned I received an email uh, this morning and it, it appears that Topaz Lake has now been identified as being infected. So as we sit here and talk about these things, which are very, very important to the state of Nevada, um, we still don't have anything in place. Um, so we need to, 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 this is timely and something that we need to move forward quickly. I just pass that along. We are sending more samples out. It's not 100%, but the samples that they uh, that they did analyze, they had uh, uh, DNA for the villagers in Topaz. So now it's Topaz, Mead, Topaz, Lahontan, and Rye Patch infected. And we certainly don't want quaggas here in the northern, um, northern waters. It would be a disaster, frankly. Okay, any uh, further commission questions, comments? Okay, thanks, Rob. I'm gonna take this up to the public. Any uh, members of the public uh, have any questions with regard to agenda item 11C on the uh, decon decontamination regulations for aquatic invasive species? Yeah, wanna, yeah. <coughs> for the record, Gil Yana, Carson Advisory Board. Uh, several members of the public who attended our meeting raised some issues with this particular item. One, they, you know, it addresses canoes, kayaks, float tubes, sailboats, dinghies, paddle boards. And there's some instructions in some of the literature we saw as to, you know, where to put the, the decals and um, people who, some of the fly fishermen that were at the meeting said, you've got a collapsible float tube. Will this decal remain in place? Or is there some type of other tag that might be attached to the valve or something so that it doesn't get damaged every time it, it, you pump the air in and out and it collapses? And a second item that was raised, again by a fisherman, was the fact that, well, rather than just pay this fee to attach it to your boat, why don't you just raise the license, the fishing license fee? That way you'd collect it from a whole lot more people than maybe don't have boats, and maybe collect a similar amount of money that's necessary to help support this kind of program. So those are just suggestions in a way to, the hassle is gonna be with the decals and the tags and on paddle boards and stuff like that that get, you know, you, you run them onto the ground, people step and walk all over them. It's, it's going to be very difficult to maintain. And what's the, probably going to, if you need a replacement tag, they're probably going to cha charge you as much as you originally paid. So they could just see some problems with that. And they thought it'd just be more practical to just raise the fee slightly to, to compensate if, they, if the department has some idea of what they might raise in, in funding from the number of of uh, decals they would sell and then calculate what it would be depending based on the amount of lice fishing license that get sold to both residents and non-residents and day licenses and limited use licenses maybe we'd come out easier and you wouldn't have the hassles of decals thank you okay. uh, let's all come on up the next agenda item isn't it for the record paul dixon Gil, we actually had the same conversation about decals, and uh, John Silberg, is that Schilberg, uh -huh. Schilberg was there with Karen. And right now, if you have a Zodiac, right. how do you hang a decal on a Zodiac today? No, not for invasive, just your decal for your boat registration. They're required to get a little placard thing that hangs off the edge. And the expectation is, is that's been in the regs and rules for a long time. The expectation is the ABS sticker 
for people that have float tubes and other things, they're going to have to build something where because of the collapsing and taking apart that basically is a little license plate that straps on the side of the thing that flips on and off that you handle that way because there really is no way to attach it to a float tube and have it be permanent. And so the expectation is, is that you're going to do the same thing for people that have Zodiacs or current inflatable boats or collapsible boats right now. The way they handle those is you build your own little placard thing to hang it off the edge of your boat or license plate holder. That's what we talked about. And I just wanted to mention that because we had, and John did bring it up down there and said that's part of the current reg and people have been doing it for years. There's no difference here except we're asking a slightly different group of people to do the same thing. We didn't actually take any action on this in, in Clark County because the actual reg came out all the reg changes came out kind of late in the game. They came out on Tuesday morning officially to everybody. We kind of tabled this one as an as a advisory board. Um, I know you guys are going to continue to move forward. I'm not sure if we're going to go final with this in this meeting with the regs. If we are, then we just didn't get time to, to address it. But we did actually talk about the fee. And uh, I think the thing that came out of the fee thing, there were people worried about adding a fee, you know, the $5 resident for non-motorized, 10 motorized. And the point is, is that if we get quagga bustles up in Wild Horse and we get stuff into the Snake River system, this state and what we pay for licenses, guys, in order to cover the lawsuits is going to be astronomical. Trust me, power companies have a lot better lawyers and a lot more money than us. Thank you. OK, any uh, further uh, comment? I have one. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Drew. Uh, just in looking online with my whiz bang phone at the 100th Meridian website for Douglas County uh, or in the vicinity of Douglas County, you're looking at 21 days of drying in January. In April, you're looking at 13, and in August, you're looking at 3. So, you know, it's kind of middle part of Nevada, you're looking at some significant drying times if we go with. Um, that 100th meridian, uh, the way it's written now. So uh, just kind of buyer beware type thing on full disclosure on what we're signing up for under G there. Yeah. I think it said 21 days in January or three days if it's been freezing for those three days. Yeah, this is going to be still 21 days in January. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, the idea of the regulations to what about, what kill the invasive, you know, species, and so what they're saying is that, that that's the only way you can do it. So I, I, I don't know a way around it. Uh, all mine. Right. Mr. Chairman, yeah, you, you want yes. To Let's really open the can of worms here, along with their, on this section one. 1D, inspect, clean, and dry all the items, including life jackets, things of that nature. So now when we go into, I know next we're going to go into float tubes, but how about the people who are, this is how extreme this thing can get to. How about the, the fishermen like, fly fishermen and the people like, like uh, I wear waders. The ones of us are waiting out in the various inlets and things like that. Now you're wearing waders, you've got your, either your felt booties on or your felt boots. So how far do we take this thing? Well. Uh, for the record, Rob Bonamici, Chief Game Warden. Uh, some states have taken it quite a ways, like to my knowledge, Alaska requires felt boots. Uh, to fall under these provisions. But for sake of, there's, you know, wind surfers out there, there's the paddle boards, there's all these other devices. And in kind of trying to take about a realistic approach as we can to things, there's a potential, and I'm just throwing it out here as an option for the commission to consider adding a section three to this regulation and that section would read something along the lines for the purposes of sections one and two decontamination and inspection only apply to vessels capable of retaining water 
So that would throw out your windsurfers and wakeboards, float tubes, all that. So that's, but also it's important that you know that as Karen, I'm sure, pointed out in Clark County at the advisory board meeting, that if these critters attach or take hold, they can live a period of time with no water. So, but the threat from some of these devices is realistically probably, you know, at the lower end of the curve. <coughs> so that's an option for the commission to consider. <coughs> Well, the, the, that hike in lake in Utah that's contaminated, and it's only float tube. So that right. means that people bringing in things contaminated at lake with float tubes. Right. So, I mean, it isn't unrealistic to think, even though it's low, that float tubes mm -hmm. will cause an issue. Correct. So, but I know there's been a lot of controversy over it, and I'm just, we're just throwing out another option here for the commission. So, Rob, the way it's written here, uh, a vessel or conveyance would be basically anything that would float in the water, whether it's motorized or not. A, a not. But it wouldn't be something like waders. Yeah, a vessel is defined by NRS, paraphrased, is any means of transportation across the body of water. And one of the things we were worried about is that the, the new rage is those surfboards that use a paddle. So is that a toy, is that a vessel? Well, it's a vessel by that definition. We really want to charge them five bucks to put that, I mean, when you take it out of the water, it's dry within a matter of, um, Yeah, and where I, do you draw the line? Is the, and more pertinent to the, one of the, the cases that I have a concern with, which would be a, you know, a float tuber who, you know, if he's out float tubing even in August and has to wait three days for his float tube to dry before he moves somewhere else, but at the same time, he doesn't have to do anything with his waders. You know, it, it seems to me we're being a little overly punitive and kind of set, setting some folks up for unintentionally breaking some of these regulations. So that's the concern I have. I think I actually like the recommendation that you propose for a Section 3. My concern is every time we come to a meeting, it seems like we're adding a new body of water. And I'm sure whoever put it in Topaz, Rye Patch, and Mahaton didn't intentionally do it and didn't know they did it. I, I think the more education we can get, uh, it just, I understand what you're saying, Jeremy, but I, I just don't know how to get ahead of this thing, and I'm, I'm afraid to not take all the steps we can to get ahead of it because we're losing daily. Yeah. The, the other piece of information uh, that might be helpful is we held a meeting a day before yesterday uh, with fisheries, TRPA, uh, law enforcement, state parks, so forth, and are in the process of establishing a pretty significant uh, public outreach program to educate the public on this because there's, there is no way we're going to enforce this. I mean, this is going to have to be a, a voluntary type situation, and then we're going to end up dealing with the extremes, those that, you know, blatantly ignore it, have been advised, hey, you need to clean the side of your boat, and basically thumb their nose and say, I'm launching anyway, and then we're going to have to step in. But, you know, short of that, it's going to be a, a mass public education undertaking. We're also um, very concerned about the convenience aspect of it. Um, you can imagine somebody driving, getting up early in the morning to drive and get to their destination. They say, what? I've got to have a, a AIS sticker. So we're working on a way for someone just to call on the cell phone, get a number, they're done. Make it as convenient as possible. Um, and of course, the dollars generated from this is going to the public outreach and buying those de uh, decontamination you know, systems and whatnot. And we'll be working on ways to decontaminate your float tube or your pontoon boat. Uh, so we, we need to do all of that stuff along the way. Yeah, this, it's no secret. This is not a piece of cake. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a lot of work and effort to get to where we need to get. I, ju I just consider the avid fly fishermen. I know one day they'll be fishing the Walker River, one day they'll be fishing the Truckee River, and 
if it's in Topaz, it's in the Walker River. And uh, the more we can do, you know, I'm just afraid it's a matter of when instead of if. And, right. And, you know, the longer we can hold it off, the better we are. But, you know, the cities, Sparks and Reno, put millions of dollars into a white water park, and then we're going to go fill that full of quaggas. I just, you know, where do you go? Well, and, man, and my only concern, and I think, you know, anything we do is going to be a vast improvement over what we've got. But, I mean, you've got four or five steps here, you know, inspect, clean, hot water, so on and so forth, and then let it dry. So that's the concern I have. I mean, you could go through, remove everything off there, clean your gear, and you're still out of the game for three to five to seven days. So, I mean, does it make sense to put an or after G or are these things, I mean, do you need to decontaminate clean and let it sit there to be effective? Quite honestly, I considered an or from a enforcement standpoint and in talking to fisheries. And in fact, I just spoke again to Deputy Director Haskins and they're pretty adamant that and needs to stay there. Are they adamant to uh, vessels and conveyances that retain water or all vessels and conveyances? No, the vessels that retain water, that's, that's that is a possibility to, to go with that. And also keep in mind that these parameters with regards to decontaminating were put in there it doesn't sound like for public convenience because it sounds like a lot of hoops, but it's fairly quick in reality. But they're in lieu of the inspection. So if somebody wants to run from Lahontan to Wild Horse and the inspection station isn't going or run to South Fork, there's no inspection station. So they don't have to worry about tracking down, going up to Tahoe to have their boat inspected or some other authorized inspection station. They can take these other steps. So that that's how that came about. Sure. Question, Hinch? Maybe I missed it somewhere along the way. What, what kind of time frame are we talking about? I know that... Uh, we had this discussion quite a while ago, but uh, the aquatic invasive species stuff has, has deadlines on it, just like the trapping stuff we were dealing with. And what? Well, the statute took effect January 1st, 2012. Right. So that also includes the next regulation you're going to hear regarding decals. Okay. So we elected to hold off till January of 2013 before implementing the decal portion, which you're going to be discussing next. The, the other parameters, they need to be put in place as soon as possible uh, because the longer we wait, then you may be hearing from Director Mayer, uh, by the way, South Fork's infected now. So. That's, and it's not designed as a scare tactic or anything like that, but it's just, yeah. it, it's just reality. Okay, so <clears throat> for tomorrow, um, I think what we're doing is we have the potential for adding this, this section three um, uh, that you've mentioned um, as being an option. Um, so um, we'll, I guess we can think about that, uh, uh, Commissioner Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one question that I had, and maybe you answered it, and I didn't quite understand it, Rob, is uh, in that in that lieu of in section two. Did I understand you right that that if if I took my boat off of Lake Mead and didn't go through the inspection station and took it to Wild Horse? Uh, what, what would happen at Wild Horse? Okay, if, if you take it off of Lake Mead and say you, there's an inspection station at Lake Mead and you go through that, they decontaminate it for you and you can demonstrate that when you get to Wild Horse. Depending on the situation, may or not be decontaminated again because 
we do, believe it or not, have people tell us stories that, oh yeah, I got it done. Uh, so, so we got to be cautious of that as well. But you, if you just pull your boat out of Lake Mead, drive to Wild Horse, and you, at that point in time, if you have not done A through G on here in section one, then you have to have it inspected before launching it. A, A through G being done at the inspection site or no. done by my, on my own? Done up by, on your own. How do I have proof of that? You, you don't. And we ha if we have an inspection station, that's why I said so much of this is education and voluntary compliance. I, I mean, I'm not here to try and fool anybody and say we're going to be nabbing people and doing this stuff because there's not enough of us to do that. Uh, so it's going to have to be voluntary. People are going to have to understand the reasons why, so they want to comply. And so they're not viewing it as just another, you know, regulation placed upon, upon them. So that's why if we have the inspection station open, you have to get in inspected. If you haven't done A through G and the inspection station is not open, then technically you're going to have to wait till the inspection station's open and it can be decontaminated. And this, yeah, can you get around it? Yes, absolutely. I know it's not under Endell's jurisdiction, but is Pyramid Lake tested and do they have an inspection station? What do they have going on out there? Do you know by chance? To my knowledge, Pyramid Lake uh, does not have an inspection station. We are going to reach out to them. Yeah. It's in their best interest, interest, but you know how it is dealing with the tribe. You just never know. It's just we, we wouldn't know. I mean, in this scenario, we don't know if it's an infected body of water or not. Right. So when it's leaving that body of water, you'd have to assume at that point that it is. Because if everything else on that side of the state is, we yeah. <clears throat> there, there's another provision in, in statute uh, that allows for the department uh, to declare impaired bodies of water. So fisheries is putting together the parameters, basically the definition for impaired bodies of water. So we can tell the public without a doubt, okay, Lahontan, you know, Colorado River system, including Lake Mojave, Lake Mead, and the Colorado River are impaired. So that would be a published document that goes out to the boaters or is available to them and incumbent upon them to know what bodies of water are impaired so when they leave Lake Mojave they know they have to clean, drain, and dry if they're going to another body of water. And we want to get everybody in the practice of doing that anyway. How well do they get a hold in the river system? I mean they, they go through the river system, but are, are they on the rocks all up and down the river system now with moving water? I would have to suspect, yes, if they clog water intakes, yeah. moving they're, water doesn't have an effect. They're in the river, but quite honestly, I was down there patrolling, and I did not see you know big masses of zebra mussels everywhere. It's It wasn't like that there. Okay. Uh, what I, uh, from reading, is that yes, they are in the river systems, but like Rob said, the, the biomass is not like it is in, in, in a lake body where the water is more stable. For sure. And, and the one concern is that not only does it clog all the water conveyance, and uh, it changes the ecosystem of the lake, which uh, <coughs> it has profound effect on, on uh, you know, fishermen and recreators and on and on and on. So. But we want to try to be reasonable here. I mean, this is going to be a huge task um, to, to try to really implement. We're going to need to do the best we can, and we need to target the most important things first. Um, so we're just going to have to get people on board to do their best. I can imagine uh, opening day at, at Knot Creek with all the float tubes. What do you mean? There's a sign there that says, i got to have a decal sticker. Um, how are we going to deal with that? The, the pushback here is going to be significant. But what we need to do is we need to get the public 
thinking like we're thinking, that the worst thing to, is to have quagga mussels everywhere. That, that's the worst thing we could do. And, talk, and uh, Mr. Dixon mentioned it, what the cost is. It's going to be through the roof. Commissioner Strom? I just want to mention, I'm reading here, it looks like it, it's going to be difficult for the average person to go ahead and, and decontaminate his own boat um, because on this um, F portion it says wash the vessel and any portion of the convenience that was in contact with the impaired body of water with high pressure hot water. So that's going to make it difficult for the average person to do it so possibly could the inspection stations have like a little little slip or something like you go you go through it and then they give you a little slip and say here you've been decontaminated so then they go to the next body of water they question they say you know here's my slip yeah the inspection stations will provide yeah. a slip and for example like trpa up at tahoe if you wish you know if you say this is the only place i'm boating is lake tahoe yeah. they'll put a seal on the boat and if that seal's not broken when you come back you're, you're good to go uh, shows you haven't launched it somewhere else so so that's also just as an aside the high pressure hot water uh, the requirements from a biological standpoint are is 140 degrees but it's like how are people going to measure you know sit there with the thermometer and measure water and then there's issues with 140 degrees out of the nozzle or 140 degrees when it hits the side of the boat where the quaggas are and it has to be 140 where it hits the side of the boat. So we just said hot water for the same concerns you had, uh, Commissioner Shrum, is so people can go to a car wash yeah. and, and utilize a car, the hand wands at the car wash. And those are usually hot water. Right. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Where to this regulation? Okay, well, we'll talk about it some more tomorrow. Okay, we'll move on. Eleven D, Commission General Regulation four zero nine LCB file number R 49 dash one two, aquatic invasive invasive species. Fees relating to vessels, Chief Rob Benamichi and Fisheries Staff Biologist Karen Vargas. Uh, the Commission may adopt a regulation relating to aquatic species, establishing the amount of, of the aquatic invasive species fee required for certain vessels, specifying the manner in which an aquatic invasive species decal must be displayed on certain inflatable vessels, uh, setting forth the required lettering, size, and color of each aquatic invasive species decal and providing other matters properly relating thereto. Chief, go ahead. Okay, for the record, Rob Bonamici, Chief Game Warden. Uh, I'm gonna go through the NRS real quick uh, that this regulation is predicated on. It's NRS 488.536, section four. The commission shall establish by regulation an aquatic invasive species fee which a for a motorboat which is owned and operated by a person who is a resident of this state must not exceed ten dollars b for a vessel other than a motorboat which is owned or operated by a person who is a resident of this state must not exceed five dollars and then c so the commission has the ability to go less than that five and ten dollars but they can't exceed five and ten dollars and then C, for a motorboat which is owned and operated by a non-resident of the state, must be $20. There are no options in statute. And D, for a vessel other than a motorboat which is owned and operated by a non-resident of the state, must be $10. So there's no options for that fee. So that being said, I'll go into the regulation. Uh, section uh, 2. Section 1, Chapter 48 of NAC is hereby amended by adding thereto the provisions set forth in Sections 2 and 3 of this regulation. Section 2, the amount of an aquatic species fee required pursuant to NRS 588.536, which I just read, is A, for a motorboat which is owned and operated by a person who is a resident of this state, $10. 
$10. B, for a vessel other than a motorboat, which is owned and operated by a person who is a resident of this state, $5. C, for a motorboat, which is owned and operated by a non-resident of this state, $20. That one we have no option. It has to be 20 And D, for a vessel other than a motorboat, which is owned and operated by a resident of this state, $10. Again, no option with that $10 fee. Okay, section two, for the purposes of NRS 488.536, the commission will interpret resident of this state to mean a person who during the six months before the person's application to the department for an aquatic invasive species decal, A, maintained his or her principal and permanent residence in this state, and B, was physically present in this state except for temporary absences. Three, as used in this section, principal and permanent residence means a place where a person is legally domiciled, maintains a permanent habituation in which the person lives and to which the person intends to return when he or she leaves the state. The term does not include merely owning a residence in the state. Section three, the aquatic invasive species decal issued by the department for an inflatable vessel with an inflatable transom may be attached to a removable plate that is securely attached to the port side transom of the vessel. Two, each aquatic invasive species decal issued by the department, A, for a vessel which is owned and operated by a resident of the state, must be designated with the letter R on the face of the decal. For a vessel which is owned and operated by a non-resident of the state, must be designated with the letters NR on the face of the decal. C, must be approximately three inches square, and D, on or after January 1st, 2013, must be issued in an annual rotation of the colors blue, international orange, green, and red. That coincides with the Coast Guard registration pattern that we abide by for our registration decals. And this regulation becomes effective January 1st, 2013. So with that, any questions? Okay, Commissioner Rain. Thank you. Um, question here involves the residency requirements. Some of this does not appear to be exactly in line with our other residence requirements. For example, maintaining a resident license. Uh, there doesn't seem to be the same exemptions in here, like military, not, you know, out of the country. There's none of those exemptions in here. Is that deliberate? Uh, yes. Uh, what we tried to do here was define residence with regards to boats because with vessels registration that's a different process uh, for example a Nevada resident through you know lifelong resident never left the state not even for a vacation uh, decides all of a sudden he's going to use his boat in California and that's the only place he's going to boat can legally register it in the state of California because under federal law boats are registered in state of principal use. So we wanted to make it real clear with the public that this isn't a state of principal use issue. That because of the way the legislation's written, it's specific to residents and not re and non-residents. It's not specific to state of principal use, which is the common uh, way to address boat registrations and the legal way. So that's why r the definition of residence was inserted in here. As opposed to our normal definition. Hmm. Any other uh, questions, comments, uh, Commissioner Drew? Um, the only question I have, and it just um, in regards to the last two regulations that we talked about, what's the department strategy in terms of the educational component? Are we going to be 
handing out information to the people that are on the water now and start getting them prepped as soon as possible or PSA type announcements or what 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 are you looking at in terms of that? What our conservation education, our boating education coordinator were discussing at our meeting, kind of a multifaceted approach. Uh, one, we're going to have to obviously notify Nevada boaters. The registered boaters, that's easy because we do a mail out with the registration every year. So that's, that's easy to cover. Okay, the hard part is the non-resident motorized boats and then the non-resident non-motorized boats and the resident non-motorized. So that's going to be a combination of billboards, we're talking about even using, utilizing the DOT signs, the flashing signs, seeing if we can't utilize those, hitting the corridors like I-80, uh, 15, that, you know, Sacramento, uh, Los Angeles, those areas where people funnel through to come to Nevada to boat and, you know, purchase radio spot in Barstow when people drive through Barstow, that type of stuff. Uh, radio, uh, media, billboards, uh, obviously all our channels, the internet, uh, Endow website, so forth. So we're, and we're looking at, uh, they exploring ways to, and they, they know a lot more about it than I do. You know, you type in, you know, Boat Nevada. Well, it takes them to a site that pretty quick that just pops up and says, hey, you need a AIS decal, here's the rules for decontamination and so forth. Anything in terms of uh, like a, a postcard that might go out to fishing license holders or even your wardens or Creole census folks that are in the field, like some sort of quick handout that directs people for more information, yeah. something like that? Yeah, they discussed multiple handouts for the boaters, the kayakers hitting the uh, associations that the paddlecraft folks belong to and all that. So it was a pretty comprehensive uh, undertaking that they were looking at. Have you looked at the signage? I, I drive to Oregon, so on I-5, there's quite a bit of signage on I-5 about this now. They use the reader boards, plus they have signs along the highway if the reader boards aren't portraying what they want at the time. So they have a lot of signage up there right now. And, and we're gonna get started soon, um, by September 1st, because um, we want people to start thinking about this, because when it goes into effect January, it's not you know a surprise to them. Yeah, our internal goal that we discussed was kind of by October 1st, if we could reach 25% of the boaters out there, which be significant, but if we can get to a quarter of them, word of mouth is really gonna start taking hold then too. Any other uh, commission questions, comments before I take it out to the public? One more quick one. Uh, that decontamination station, is there a charge for that? There, yeah, there is a charge for some of them. Lake Mead has one, I believe they charge, I'm not sure how much they charge for that. But the ones we're looking at, like it, the, we provide and authorized folks of us provide, you know, like say, parks or state parks at South Fork has one. Those are going to be free because that's what the, the decal covers. Uh, oh, but shouldn't it be based on the size of the boat when you start charging? It, we're, yeah, it could be, but we're trying to keep this as simple as possible. We're going to have enough Good. issues come up. Uh, again, when we do regulations, we try and just, like I said earlier, try and keep things as simple as possible and you know the bigger point here is voluntary compliance and educating the people i mean that that's really what we're striving for well, one idea that rob had quite some time ago and i think it's a wonderful idea we when we start generating money we can do these things but but somehow maybe there would be a cottage in industry that could develop from this whether it's the car washes whatever that they get the 140 degree water you can drive in there 
uh, you know, and try to get the public sector, uh, private sector involved uh, in, in this as well. So I think there's a lot of great ideas out there. Um, we just got to get started. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, thanks Rob, I'm going to take it out to the public. Any uh, public comment uh, on this, uh, Gil? For the record, Gil Yannick, a uh, private citizen. Uh, if I understood what Rob said, if you come out of the water and you go through a decontamination center, then there's no waiting. You can go to another body of water tomorrow. Right. The, the equipment or the chemical or whatever they're going to do to do the decontamination, if a private citizen were to use the same material, would he too be able to go into another body the next day if it made, was made available to the public or the formula or if you use, you know, 30% Clorox or who knows what? You come, you're going to come up with in the decontamination center that permits the instantaneous use of the vessel in another water. Why wouldn't people want to spend the extra money to get that so they wouldn't have to wait three days, 10 days, 21 days? Uh, for the record, Rob Bonamici to try and address that. Uh, basically, the department approves inspection stations and, and not individuals. So like TRPA would be approved by the department. If we did the private enterprise option, specific car washes or what have you, would have to be approved by us. Uh, we wouldn't be approving individuals uh, to decontaminate their own boat uh, just because that would be pretty onerous because everybody would want to do that. And, but out of that, as with this progresses, they seem to be learning more and more about the quaggas all the time. Uh, then perhaps, you know, we'd be back in... 10 years saying, hey, if you use a certain chemical that they developed, just sprayed it on your boat, you're good to go. I, we don't know. So as it stands now, it's not for private individuals. It's basically governmental entities, private you know, corporations. Okay. Any additional public comment? Okay, seeing none, uh, uh, I assume uh, no additional comment questions from the commission on this. So. Okay, um, that leaves us with our last agenda item. Uh, 